الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته my dear brothers and sisters i hope that this finds you in the best of good health and iman as today we are going to be continuing with the very important topic we were discussing and that is the question and the topic of fornication and adultery and we already mentioned in the last episode the terrible punishment that is waiting in the hellfire for those people and the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will be upon those people who commit fornication and adultery and that is the punishment in the next life amongst the punishments my dear brothers and sisters in this life is that when fornication and adultery becomes widespread amongst the people the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that poverty will spread amongst them and death will spread amongst them and disease indeed in one narration the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that new diseases will come that the people never heard of before this is exactly what we find my dear brothers and sisters happening with us today we find many new diseases things that we have never heard before like aids which is of course specifically and almost very strongly at least not exclusively but very very strongly connected with sexual acts uh, and really acts that are outside marriage in most cases that is the cause but many other sexual diseases apart from aids stds as they call them but many other diseases as well other than sexual diseases it is happening just as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said would happen death will spread and poverty is another thing that happens when this fornication becomes widespread these are things that it doesn't seem to have any immediate connection it doesn't seem to have any statistical or rational or scientific way to connect these things but this is knowledge from the unseen this is knowledge from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge the evil consequences of sins are many and they happen in different ways that we do not understand there is a whole spiritual dimension that when we do things like fornication like adultery even when we look at members of the opposite sex that are not from those people who are halal for us but when men look at women and they stare at them and they stare at their beauty it is like an arrow that shaitan uses to kill your heart bit by bit this sin damages your heart causes darkness on your heart and eventually the rust comes on your heart and your heart becomes dead you do not any more remember allah no there is no more humility there is no more humbleness before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the light of iman is taken away this is a truly disastrous thing but in this life in our real practical life there is also terrible consequences from these sins of fornication and adultery and amongst the consequences brothers and sisters is something important to understand this intimate act is not something in our religion that is haram to spell it out very frankly sex is not something forbidden or looked down upon or frowned upon in our religion alhamdulillah it is something for us to enjoy and to benefit from even it does not have to be merely from procreation one can have this enjoyment as an enjoyment but in a way that is halal in the way that is lawful indeed if we do it in the lawful way we get rewarded the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that you are rewarded if you have intimate relations with your wife or the wife with the husband if you have this relationship if you do commit this act in the lawful way you will get rewarded for it the companions of the prophet said we get rewarded for that they couldn't believe it they were getting rewarded for that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said if you did it in an unlawful way wouldn't you get punished so this is the beauty of our religion brothers and sisters the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he advised the young people get married if you have the ability to get married get married if you have the means and it doesn't mean the means does not entail that you have you know a nice car a nice house you have so much money in your bank account no indeed the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions lived simple lives and we should not imagine that marriage entails or necessitates all sorts of difficulties and problems like we find very very sadly this exists in so many places in the muslim world where the mahr 
is huge and where the man has to have so many requirements before he can get married. What is the consequence of that, brothers and sisters? The consequence of that is fornication. Fornication and homosexuality. These are two things that have spread because marriage is being made difficult. Marriage is being made difficult. This is the reality of the man. The man needs to express that sexual desire that he has in a physical way. It is a need that is very strong within him and drives him, and women as well, of course. But it happens that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this intimate act something very special. And you know, we live in an age, brothers and sisters, where there is a lot of what they call casual sex. Casual sex. I mean, this is very true in the West, and it is becoming true in other countries, very sadly, countries where they used to have a sense of decency, where it used to be considered only appropriate for a man and a wife to perform this act. But now, the, what you can call recreational sex has become very, very common, where people are just having sexual intercourse as a pastime. Like you drink a bottle of Coca-Cola, you watch a movie and have an ice cream, Sex is another thing that you do to pass the time and have fun. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there thinking, what's wrong with that? You know, I'm having fun, I'm enjoying myself, I'm not hurting anyone. You know, we are consenting adults, she agrees, I agree. And from that angle, you may think, well, what's wrong? Well, I think that's a very superficial way of looking at it. First of all, this whole issue of consent is very controversial. Is it really that a person is consenting? What does consent mean? What influences a person to do something like that? Is it just that simple? Or does a person feel they have to do that because that's what everybody else is doing? Is that really consent? I don't think it's that simple at all. The other thing, and this is a fact, that this intimate act is combined with many, many physical, physiological, chemical, and psychological things that are connected with it. It is not just a simple act of recreation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed. And even from the point of view, if one does not talk about Allah being the creator, but if a person even thinks from a evolutional point of view or a scientific point of view, this act has developed for a reason. There are certain chemical and physical changes that happen. This act of intimacy has many different things that is there for a specific purpose. One of its very important components is that the intimate act, the sexual act, is a bonding. It is a type of bonding that takes place between the woman and the man. This act causes closeness not only physical closeness, but it causes a mental, even a spiritual closeness to develop between them. It is something that allows a man and a woman to build a lasting relationship. So if we look at sexual intercourse within the context of marriage, for example, what we find is that obviously, number one, it has the purpose of procreation, that is very important of producing offspring, of producing children, and that is very important for our survival as human beings and our continued survival as human beings. But it is also part of the bonding that takes place between the man and the woman. And within the context of marriage, it is something that the husband and the wife return to in order to bring themselves close together and to develop that closeness and that love between each other. And when there are things that go wrong, and things that happen, and even when they have arguments, this is something that happens between them, that in a sense, bring things back together, brings that closeness back towards them, redevelops the love amongst them, and it serves this very, very important function. Now, think now. If you treat sexual intercourse as a pastime, like you watch a movie, or you like you drink alcohol. What is there left in marriage? And you may say to me, oh, that's it, look at you, you're just reducing marriage to sex. Is that all marriage is about? Obviously not. Of course marriage is not just about that. 
No, it has many, many other important components. But it is a very, very important component. And it's something special. It should be something special to marriage because it is essential in that bonding process. If you remove that exclusive relationship, if you remove the exclusivity of sex within marriage, if you remove it and say, no, that action or that uh, thing can be done in many, many different times and many different places with many different people, it can be casual, it can be just entertainment. So what I'm saying is you remove it outside the sphere of marriage, what you end up doing is in reality removing one of the most powerful forces that helps keep a man and woman together. That's what you do. That's why casual sex, fornication and adultery is so dangerous because it goes back to what we were talking about. It undermines the very foundation of the most important component in human life, in human social life, I mean. I suppose the most important component in our life may be water and food, and, but I mean in human social life, and that is the family. We go back to the family. It is so important that as much as is possible, the husband and wife should have the means to be able to not only stay together, but have a happy and a harmonious and a loving and an intimate relationship with each other. Because from that harmony and peace and intimacy and love flows love and intimacy and harmony to the children and then to the wider society. So that is why it is very, very important. And I'm really just talking from, in a sense, you could talk about a psychological a point of view or a sociological point of view. Look how important this act is in preserving the family, the love, the relationship between the husband and the wife. And that goes back to what we were talking. That is why it's so important the wife does not refuse her husband. And indeed, of course, the husband in that respect needs to also satisfy his wife. And that is why it is so important that society is protected from treating sexual intercourse as a casual pastime that can be taken place between any number of human beings. It is something that should be confined to the husband and the wife, and in order for society to be preserved, that act needs to be preserved within the context of marriage. At the very least, it should not be allowed that people should generally think that it is a something that they can do. That is why we have to have very severe consequences, criminal punishments, if you would say that, for those people who publicly and openly transgress those limits, who take this sexual act out of the realm of the husband and wife relationship and they take it into the broader sphere. Whether it is fornication or adultery or homosexuality because homosexuality to put it in context is part of that same issue that is why similarly homosexuality is viewed in Islam as being such a negative and dangerous thing one of the reasons for that is because it again similarly strikes at the root of that concept of family, the man and the wife, the man and the woman, the whole structure, the whole natural process that we believe is intrinsically natural to the human life. And we're going to be talking a little bit about this issue uh, of homosexuality, but before I do that, I want to talk about something that is very much connected to the whole idea of preserving chastity. And that is, again, uh, I'm going to be talking to my sisters here in Islam, my sisters in humanity as well, who may be listening and watching. And that is guarding your modesty. That is dressing in a way that is modest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in the Quran, let the believing women, let the believing women draw the khimar over their chests. Let them guard their modesty and guard their private parts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions and tells us in Surah An-Nur, and it is quite clear that they should draw their jilbabs. The word used in the Quran is the jilbab, which means a loose outer cloak 
that covers the shape of the body and the khimar, the headscarf. These things are mentioned in the Quran, contrary to what some people who probably, I don't even think they've read the Quran, they say, oh, there's nothing in the Quran about hijab. There's nothing in the Quran about the uh, jilbab. There's nothing in the Quran about the veil. Okay, that is controversial about the veil. And I won't go into that controversy right now. But let us agree without any doubt. Uh, and this is very clear from the Quran that the wearing the hijab, the scarf, and the loose garment that covers the shape of the body, because that's what is understood by jilbab in the Arabs who lived at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And the reason why Allah says is two reasons. Number one, so the people may know that you are believing women. So it is a sign that you are a believing woman and you will go unmolested. People will leave you alone because why? Your dress makes a statement about you. Your dress says something about you. If I dress in army uniforms the whole time, that tells people I'm a militaristic type of person. Even if I'm not, that's the idea that people get. The way you dress tells something about you. For example, let us look at the dress of the nun. So that is really the wisdom behind these teachings in the religion of Islam concerning the fornication and concerning the adultery and things that are connected with it. Like, for example, the woman covering herself, which is also a very important component part of producing this chaste society where people, inshallah, alhamdulillah, are living really, in reality, beautiful, happy lives. You know, brothers and sisters, I could probably spend a lot of time talking about my experiences before I became Muslim. And I have lived both lives. I have lived that life where sex was treated as a pastime. And I have lived my life as a Muslim where it is confined to marriage. And I know the difference between the two things. I honestly, to any of you listening out there who are teenagers or who are parents of teenagers, I would not wish upon any of you the lifestyle of girlfriends and boyfriends. It is really, truly horrible. The emotional turmoil that it, it causes within a person, the jealousy and the envy and the problems and all the things that go with it, it is not something I would wish upon anybody. And when I in my own life can compare it to the peace and tranquility and joy of a Muslim marriage, I don't need to worry, I am here recording these programs in India and my wife is thousands of miles away in England but I'm not worried about what's going to my wife up to who is she meeting who is she going to dinner with is some old friend of hers going to contact her on Facebook and is she going to go out with dinner without me knowing this and that you may say oh you're insecure in this and that whatever you know best you know the reality you can fool yourself you can fool other people I know I've lived that life and I know what it's like but I don't have to worry about that as a Muslim you may say, oh, I don't worry about it either. I think that's a lie. I think most of you do. But I really don't as a Muslim. Why? Because I know that my wife will not let a strange man into the house. She will not even talk to a strange man on the phone uh, unless there is some real need to do that. I know that my wife, alhamdulillah, covers herself from head to toe, including her face. That gives me security. That gives me happiness to know that no one is seeing her except me. And she feels modest and shy and doesn't like anyone to see her except her husband. Can you imagine the peace from that? Can you imagine the security from that? Can you imagine the ease and the comfort I feel from that? It is truly amazing and this preserves a beautiful harmony within the family. And I don't come back to my wife with suspicions and wondering and wanting to check her phone bill and her... No! You see my brothers and sisters, what a beautiful, harmonious type of existence we have when we follow the deen of Islam. And similarly, my wife knows I will not be shaking the hand of some strange woman. I will not be sitting alone with some strange woman without someone being there. She knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told me, lower my gaze and guard my private parts and so on and so forth. So this is the beautiful thing about this religion. This is the harmony, this is the peace. And similarly, with your children, with your daughters, with your sons, if you teach them correctly, you will not be worried that they're going to fall into these things. So this is the wisdom. This is the beauty of this deen. Why do you want to abandon that? 
for these crazy ways from the time of ignorance that causes misery and disease and unhappiness and unwanted pregnancies. And we talk about murder. I don't even think we mentioned abortion. Maybe we did, which is also a type of murder, a consequence, and illegitimate children. This is another consequence of fornication and adultery and all the things and the shame that comes with it. And then in order to overcome the shame, they have to try and shift human nature. It's not going to work. What works is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. And so finally, we want to very, very briefly uh, touch upon the issue uh, of homosexuality, which again is something which is a serious, serious sin in the religion of Islam, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited us from. And of course, as we know in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that there was a nation of people who he destroyed that, the people of Lut. It's known in the Bible as Sodom and Gomorrah, who Allah destroyed them primarily because of their indulgence uh, in this activity. And the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah has cursed anyone who does what the people of Lut did. And in fact, indeed, again, it is one of those things that has a prescribed punishment in Islamic law for people who are found participating in this, what is considered to be an unnatural act. We don't believe that people are naturally born inclined to this. No, that is something that is from a false desire or maybe from a circumstance in their life that they are led towards this, but it is considered to be in the religion of Islam an unnatural act. And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran and in Surah Al-Shura, the meaning of which is, of all creatures in the world, do you approach males and leave those whom Allah created for you as your mates, but rather you are transgressors. It's very clear. Allah has created four men, women as their mates. To approach a male is something that is considered to be uh, unnatural, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and gives the meaning of which truly they were an evil people, perverted. This is what the meaning of the word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. The throne of Allah shakes when this thing takes place. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from these things. Brothers and sisters, if you have participated in any of these things, repent to Allah. The doors of Allah are always open. Seek his forgiveness. Seek his guidance. Leave these things and live the beautiful, pure life as a believer and taste its blessings and its benefits. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.